ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء اتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما my brothers we all are here because we believe in la ilaha illallah and part of believing in la ilaha illallah we believe that allah is our creator and he created everything that exists so that makes us slaves of this creator but it's not just humans and jinn that worship allah every single thing that we see and we don't see worships allah the sun the moon the stars the mountains all of this worships allah and allah describes their worship as he says in the quran alam tara anna allah yasjudu lahu man fis samawati wa man fil ard everything in the heavens and the earth makes sujood to allah wa ash-shams wa al-qamar wa an-nujum wa al-jibal wa ash-shajar all of these entities make sujood and they worship allah but more specifically about the sun Abu Dhar radiyallahu an said that we were sitting with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his masjid one day and the sun had set and we prayed maghrib salah so then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ya abu dhar atadri ayna taghrib ash-shams do you know where the sun goes when it goes down they said allah wa rasuluhu a'lam teach us ya rasulullah give us this piece of information that you're alluding to because it seems very important the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said innaha tadhhab hatta tasjud tahta arsh ar-rahman it goes until it goes underneath the arsh ar-rahman and it makes sujood it makes sujood to allah under his arsh another hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the shams says to allah i'm not going to move until i know that my sujood has been accepted and allah says go back and the shams said, I'm not going to move until I know my sujood has been accepted. This happens three times. And then Allah says, Irji'i, go back, min haythu jitti. From where the place that you came, from orbit. And this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Said in the, after that, the ayah from surah Yasin. Ash-shamsu tajri li mustaqarrin laha. This is the orbit of the sun. When it sets, it sets and it makes sujood to ar-Rahman. And then when it comes back up, ar-Rahman orders it. to come and orbit the way it orbits but there was one day that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explained to us also that the sun stopped its orbit yes the sun stayed in the sky the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that yusha ibn nun a nabi a companion of musa alaihi salam the, the the story that we recite every friday where musa and a young boy went off to khidr that young boy his name was yusha Yusha bin Nun and he later became a prophet and from the commands that Allah gave to this prophet was to go into Palestine and liberate Palestine for la ilaha illallah but the condition was that when it becomes night time you are not allowed to go into Palestine you are not allowed to fight in Palestine so he went and it was salatul asr and he realized now the sun is moving and it's going down So Yusha knew that he will not be able to achieve and fulfill the aim. So he made a supplication. He said to the sun, he spoke to the sun, "Inna ki ma'mura wa ana ma'mur." You have been commanded and I have been commanded. I've been commanded to go into Palestine and you have been commanded to do your orbit. So then he supplicated to Rahman. He said, "Allahumma ahbisha." Allahumma ahbisha. He kept repeating, "Oh Allah, make it still. Make it still." And there was a narration where the Prophet ﷺ said that it stayed still 
for one hour. The sun stayed still for one hour so that Yusha could fulfill his aim. My brothers, this weekend we are having an hour taken away from us. Instead of there being 24 hours, in one of these days we will have 23 hours. And if I was to ask you now, let me take your house away from you for one hour. Let me take your car away from you for one hour. Let me take your phone away from you for one hour. What would you think? You think this man is trying to oppress me. Where will I go for one hour? Where will I sit? Sit out on the road like a homeless man? What am I supposed to do for one hour? My brothers, the Salaf were even more hasty and more protective of their time than this one hour that I've just described to you. Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said, Wallahi, I've met people, they used to preserve their time just like you preserve your gold and your silver. The passwords that you have on your mobile phone, the data that you seek to protect, your bank accounts that you want to hold on and keep, keep secure. Hassan al-Basri said that there are people who view their time just like you have that connection with your data. Hassan al-Basri also said, rahimahullah, Ya Ibn Adam, the day that comes to you every single day, the time the sun rises, and every single day that you are given is a gift from Ar Rahman. Treat it like a gift. Treat it like a guest that's coming into your house. Treat it nicely. Protect it. Be nice to it. Because when it goes away, either that guest will say something good about you, or it will say something bad about you. Some of the Salaf used to say, Rahimahullah, I wish that time could be something that could be bought. You have one hour to sell, I will buy it. How much do you want? 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. If I have the money, I will buy that one hour from you. Because they knew that time is their capital assets. They knew time will be their Jannah or their Jahannam. But some of us may ask, it's only one hour. I'm going to be sleeping anyway. It's not going to make a big difference to my life. One hour comes in the Qur'an in many different contexts. Yes, one hour. Allah says one hour in the Qur'an in many different ways. One of the ways he mentions the word one hour, or the words one hour, one, one hour in Arabic, sa'a. He talks about the people of Jannah. After they enter Jannah, it will be asked them, to them, قَالَ كَمْ لَبِثْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَدَدِ السِّنِينَ How long did you stay on the earth? How many months? How many years? How many centuries? Some ummas, they stayed for centuries. Nuh alayhi salam stayed on this earth for 950 years. So we'll be asked to them once they enter Jannah, how many years did you stay? The people of Jannah, what do you think they will say? They will say, قَالُوا لَبِثْنَا يَوْمْ أَوْ بَعْدَ يَوْمْ We stayed for 24 hours. Or maybe even less than that. 10 hours, 12 hours. We don't know. فَاسْأَلِ الْعَادِّينَ Don't ask us. Ask the angels that were writing everything down. We have no recollection of how long we stayed in the dunya. And the ulama of tafsir have taken this part where Allah says, First al-Adin. Because the people of Jannah know that they didn't enter Jannah because of that amount of time they stayed on earth. They know that they entered Jannah because of the tawfiq that Allah gave them to do good deeds. This is why you find some people, they live for 30 years. They live for 40 years. They may even live for 20 years and they will enter Jannah because they use their time properly, filling it with good deeds. The opposite is also true, my brothers. When the people will enter the hellfire, when the people will enter the hellfire, the kuffar that will be in the hellfire, they will swear by Allah. They will say, Ma labithu ghayr We didn't stay on earth for more than one hour. We did not stay on earth for more than one hour. Imam al-Sa'di, rahimahullah, he said that the reason why they will say one hour is because on the day of judgment, they know that the punishment will be intense. They know that the fire they will see in front of them is relentless. So they will say to Allah, we only stayed there for one hour. Only punish us equivalent to one hour that we stayed on earth. One hour, my brothers. There's another ayah where Allah says in the Quran, كَأَنَّهُمْ يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَ مَا يُؤَدُونَ لَمَّا يَلْبَثُوا إِلَّا سَاءَةً مِنْ نَهَارٍ On that day, 
they will think that they only stayed on earth for one hour from the day. This is very important. Why does Allah say one hour from the day? Well, one of the Mufassirun, Rahimahullah, Tahir ibn Ashur, he said one hour because this gives you an insight as to how they spent the rest of their lives. One hour was nothing. One hour, it didn't mean anything to them. So what does that mean? These minutes and these seconds that fill up one hour, it just became time pass. Let's kill the time. Let's enjoy the time. And this became their motive in life. Every single day was, it's just time. It's passing. Let me enjoy it. But Allah also says, min har, from the day. Why from the day? Because when it's daytime, that's when you get busied. That's when you become distracted. So the reason why these people fell into the hellfire is because they didn't use their time properly. They didn't have a good connection with their time. And time made them too busy to worship Ar-Rahman. My brothers, this hellfire that the Qur'an repeats a lot is something which is intense. It's not fiction. It's not imaginary. And this is why the Prophet وسلم, in many hadith, he spent out and he explained the description of the hellfire to his companions so that they could be filled with iman. So he said in one of the hadith, he said, Narukum juz'um min sab'ina juz'a min nari jahannam. The fire that you see on earth is only one seventieth of the fire that you will have in the hellfire. One seventieth. If anybody tries to touch the fire today, they will burn their skin, they will burn their cells, they will burn their nervous system. It will be extremely detrimental to them, to the extent that even animals know this. But in the Akhirah, this fire will only be one seventieth. But look what the companions, radiallahu anhum, said. They said, Ya Rasulullah, will it be enough? 70 different types of hell or fire, will it be enough to fulfill everybody that's going to enter the hellfire? Because they knew that most of the people do not worship Allah and they do not obey their messengers. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Fuddilat alayhin bitis'a wa sitteen juz'a. Kulluhun bimithliha. Every single part of the hellfire that we've just talked about, the 70 different parts, it will be multiplied by itself. It will be multiplied by itself so it can engulf all the people that will enter it. My brothers and sisters, the salaf of this ummah, they didn't see it as something which was fiction. This is why one of the salaf, he said that if the people, after they enter the hellfire, they would wish to come back to the dunya, even if it meant that they would be in the hellfire or the fire of the dunya. To the extent that one of the salaf said that if they came back, they will sleep in the fire of the dunya. Why? Because it will be cool for them. It will be relaxation for them. My brothers and sisters, the hellfire is intense. And in the hellfire, there is no respite. There is no water. There is no coolness. There is no relaxation. And there will be a conversation that will happen between the people of the Halfa and the people of Jannah after they enter to their places. Wanada ashabu nar ashabu Jannah. The people of the Halfa, they will call out to the people of Jannah. They will say, Oh, people of Jannah, in front, on top of us. And afidu alayna min al ma aw min ma razakkumullah. Give us something, just one drop of the water that Allah has given you in your Jannah or something that He has given you of your sustenance from the Jannah. Something so that we can relax for at least a little bit. This is intense. What will the people of Jannah say? Inna Allah harramahuma al kafirin. This will be even more as a rejection and humiliation for them. The people of Jannah will say it's haram for you. It's not possible for us to descend from Jannah and give you the risk of Jannah which is made everlasting which is made blissful which is made enjoyment to give it to you who will be in the hellfire forever so my brothers the, me- the message is here that we are now coming into a season of summer we are now 
coming into a season where the days will be longer. But yes, before that, we are going to take some time away from us. So use this period of time, the season that's going to come in front of you, so that it can earn your Jannah and it won't be a calamity against you. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an wa sunnah. أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد My brothers, all of us recite and we've memorized جزء أما We teach our children جزء أما and this is the last chapter of the Qur'an. And Juz Amma is full of examples of how people will be successful or unsuccessful in the hereafter. One example is in Surah Naziat. And Surah Naziat talks about the process of death. And within that process of death, Allah describes how He created the heavens so big and mighty. He created for us the earth and He rolled it out for us. And towards the end of the surah, when after Allah has described the creation, He says that there is going to come to you a tamatu sugra, a tamatu kubra. So the ulama of tafsir have said that if there is going to be a major disaster that's going to fall before every single one of us, when death comes, there will also be a tamatu sugra, meaning that there is going to be a minor form of day judgment before we face Allah. My brothers, this surah tells us that Allah has created the creation so that we may ponder on our return to Him. And there are many surahs also in Juz Amma which talk about time and the surahs are named after time. Surah Fajr, the morning. Surah Shams, the day. Surah Layl, night time. Surah Duha, the morning time. The mid-morning time. And Surah Asr itself talks about Time. And Imam Suyut, he said, if you look at the message of these surahs, Allah is mentioning time, and within these surahs, Allah is talking to us about Tawheed. Allah is talking to us about obeying the messengers. Allah is talking to us about establishing the Salat, establishing the Zakat, cooperating in goodness. And Allah is telling us to help the needy and to be with the poor in Surah Duha. My brothers, these surahs are giving us a message that Allah has attributed time to your actions, success or failure. And there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that there will be seven people that he will shade on the day of judgment when there will be no shade except his. And he mentioned one of them, the last one, or Rijal, or Rajul, Dhakarullah Khaliyan Fafadat Aina. In his own privacy, he remembered Allah constantly. And he used to cry and he used to ponder on the message that his Lord gave him. The Quran and the Sunnah and the vastness of his Lord's mercy and his extreme power and glorification. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said that day is going to be such a day where it's going to split the people of joy and it's going to split the people who will not have any joy. He said that the sun has been described that it will be above their heads, the distance of a mile. And he explains this, and he says the reason why it's going to be above your head with the distance of a mile, because that day the sun will not have an orbit anymore. That day the sun will not go up and come down, it's just going to be static above your head. If that's the case, the sun will actually be bigger than it is now. If that's the case, the, the heat will be even more intense because, as we know, when the sun comes up in the morning and when it goes down, the level of heat differs during the day. On that day, there will be none of this. It will not move and it will be greater and it will be hotter. My brothers, summer is a time where the believers are tested and where nifaq becomes apparent. And there's an incident that happened in the time of the Prophet wasallam, where there was a battle that they went to in the intense heat of summer. They were going to fight an army which was much bigger than theirs to the extent that some of the companions feared that they were going towards their death. 
it was a time where they didn't have much money to the extent that Uthman radiallahu an paid for the whole expedition by himself the camels and everything else that was needed but there were people with them that didn't really want to be there so they said they were happy with sitting back Khilafa Rasulullah they didn't want to stay and go forward with the Prophet. They wanted to stay back. They were being forced to join the army because they know if they stay back in Medina, it will be detrimental. They will find out that these people are Munafiq. So they went with the Muslims, but they didn't want to be there. They didn't want to spend their money. They didn't want to spend their own time to be there because they said, what did they say? They were saying to each other, don't go out, it's too hot. This is summer. The days are long, the heat is intense, the distance is far away, and look how big the army is. We're going to lose, surely. What does this tell us, my brothers? That summer is a time where some people will become lazy. Summer is a time where some people will be happy not to listen to the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some people will be happy to create fitna in this season. Some people will be happy to be idle and sit at home and not go out for the sake of Allah. Go out to the masjid. Go out and do what Allah has commanded you to do. Some of these people will be happy to sit in the shade with their social media, with the television in front of them. Relax. But then what does Allah say to rebuke these people? قُلْ نَارَ جَهَنَّمُ أَشَدُّ حَرَّا لَوْ كَانُوا يَفْقَهُونَ the intense heat of the hellfire that we've described in this khutbah is even more intense than the heat of the summer. So you can choose. Where is your end? Do you want to persevere and have sabr for the sake of Allah in this dunya or the heat of the hellfire? Lokanu yafqahoon aligns the ayah with. They don't have intelligence, they don't have knowledge. They were happy with their state of ignorance. They were happy to be against the Messenger, السلام, be against the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, and be lazy and stay at home, and be happy in their state of ignorance. My brothers, going back to the hadith of those who will be underneath the Arsh, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, says something which is very important about summer. And this is something I think we should all pay attention to. He said, look at the amazement of this hadith. There is a man who's going to be underneath the Arsh al-Rahman, relaxing. Joy, pleasure, coolness, happy, success. He knows he's not going to the hellfire. Why? Because in the dunya, he preserved himself in the hot days. He stayed at home and he wept over the ayat of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He implemented it in his life. He stayed away from fitna. He stayed away from all of the troubles that can happen in this season of summer. So what did Allah reward him with? Allah rewarded him with shade. But there are people on the opposite. They go out in the days of summer. They want to spread fitna. They want to look at the women. They want to listen to the music. They don't want to lower their gaze. They want to create fitna. And they're happy to do this in the heat of the summer. What will happen to them? They will not have any coolness. And they will have the sun be reduced towards them. Allahu Akbar, my brothers. Summer is a time where we can also gain a lot of khair. But it's also a time which is very, very testing. And I end my khutbah with this one statement, which I want you all to think about. And it summarizes the situation very well. One of the aima of the salaf, one of the imams of the salaf, his name was Bilal ibn Sa'ad, rahimahullah. And he's asking you a question, where will you be? He said, if you ask a person, do you want to die right now? He will say, no, naturally he doesn't want to die. So then we follow up with this question, why? Why, do you, why don't you want to die? He said, I am not ready for death. This is the natural answer that you will get from humans, Muslim or non-Muslim. Then the next question which presents itself is, okay, you don't want to die because you want a chance to do good deeds. Let's do good deeds together. Do you want to do good deeds? What will he say? Inshallah. What will he say in Arabic? 
بلال بن سعد رحمه الله قال سوف 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 أفعل I will do it إن شاء الله so look at this Bilal ibn Sa'ad. He summarizes the situation of man. They don't love death because they want to prepare for it. When you ask them to prepare for it, they don't want to prepare for it. So life and death is become a place for him to respite. Oh Allah, please wait for me. Oh Allah, please have sabr with me. Oh Allah. This is what he's saying every single day. I don't want to do good deeds, but I don't want to die. Oh Allah, just be patient with me. Tomorrow I will. So Bilal ibn Sa'ad, rahimullah, he said, if you don't sacrifice your desires, if you don't sacrifice your time, then you will never be prepared for death. هذا صلوا وسلموا على رسولكم حيث أمركم وقال إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والمشركين ودمر التاتين يا هيو يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث أسلئ لنا شؤوننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين اللهم آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا ذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين